Hello and welcome to the True Hearted Trainer podcast with me, Dr. Lisa. I'm your host, I'm a veterinarian and I'm also a Delta accredited professional dog trainer. And welcome to episode five, how do we set our dogs up for success in training and what does this mean? Well, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the podcast with this thought. Now, setting our dog up for success, um, let's take a look again at that concept. We touched on that in um, episode four, and that was based on um, looking at concepts uh, and how they can help us reset and get us back on track, um, especially when we find that we might not be making progress, and also in the first instance when we want to set our dog up for success and um, account for all those all those variables the environment how we're contributing to the environment to help or hinder our dog in their training and how our dog's responding and looking at their body language so um but for this for this podcast i'm looking at it on a deeper level and um i'm also looking at how dogs differ to us with respect to their senses that is how they see things visually and their sense of hearing and how we can um, look at these types of things to help adjust our training situations and help our dogs be successful based on how they see and how they hear. So first of all, let's talk about um, the peripheral vision of dogs. Now, dogs have a much better peripheral vision than humans. They've got a wider visual field and it's very good for detecting movement. Now, um, the retina is very interesting. It ha- it, it's a thin layer of tissue at the back of the eye and it's full of cells that are sensitive to light and the cells in the retina they translate the light energy and transform that into nerve impulses that are transmitted down the optic nerve and into the brain. And the brain then forms the visual image after translating all that information. Now, what's even more interesting with dogs' retinas is that there are two types of um, retinal patterns with respect to the concentration of cells that are on the retina and depending on the type of pattern we actually see correlations with the length of the dog's nose and also that correlates with the types of breeds of different dogs and the first pattern is called a visual streak so basically this just means that the concentration of the uh, cells on the retina Um, they're in a pattern that is in a band or a streak that sort of roughly extends from one side of the retina to the other. Now, the other type of pattern is a central area and this differs with the pattern of the visual streak in that it's actually, like the name says, it's uh, the, the cells of the retina are actually concentrated in the central area of the retina. And... Once again, these two patterns correlate with the length of the dog's nose and then we can also start thinking about the types of breeds that have longer noses than others and what dogs may actually have a visual streak. Now, why is this important? It's important because the visual streak compared to the central area actually fine tunes that peripheral vision. So if we think about dogs with long noses like the sight hounds, greyhounds, um, we've got the Saluki, the Irish Wolfhound, Basenjis, and Greyhounds, of course. Now, they're the types of dogs that they're called sight hounds, and they have very good um, sense of sense of sight, and they do enjoy chasing things. And their peripheral vision is very finely attuned because of the visual streak. Now, um, when we're comparing the central area um, pattern. Now, compared, like comparing Marco to a longer nose uh, breed of dog, Marco does have a reasonably long nose, but he's probably likely to have more of a central pattern um, of um, concentration of, of, of cells in the retina rather than a visual streak. And that's um, pretty obvious because he doesn't have much of a, a, a high instinct to actually chase things. Um, so... We can see how these these pieces of information are very valuable in then adjusting our training environment and having a rethink about where we're actually going to start training with our dogs. Now, for instance, um, if we wanted to take our dog to 
an off-leash park if we're at an advanced level of training and we're working on our recall and we want to have a lot of other things training-wise in place before that happens. Or let's let's look at a, a, a different example, maybe in a public place like a park. So with respect to those two different types of retinal patterns, the cell patterns, um, if we think about... Um, dogs that have a visual streak, then we have to be more aware of not just the obvious distractions that are going to be quite close to us and in the vicinity, but also potential distractions that could be on the horizon a little bit further further away. And um, in a park situation, we can understand that there's lots of different things happening in the periphery that are going to be very distracting to uh, a, a dog that has a longer nose and the, a, a likelihood of having a visual streak which is going to enhance their um, ability to want to chase things and be more attuned to the peripheral um, environment as to what's going on there. So that's an interesting little piece of scientific information. And the next thing moving on from that is to consider how humans see. We're actually very able to readily see objects, whether they're moving or whether they're standing still. But dogs, again, are much better at seeing objects that are moving. And so it makes sense that if they're able to see things that are moving, then using hand gestures, hand gestures are going to be very clear uh, ways of communicating with our dogs so we don't confuse them. And also standing in one place while we're using a hand gesture, which might be a sit, or it could be a stay, or it could be a this way, or it could even be a stand, um, or a look at me. Uh, so by using hand gestures, our dog is going to clearly be able to see what we're trying to communicate and they'll be able to understand what that what that um, hand gesture comes to mean when we're training with them. So in my experience, humans rely too much on their voice um, when they're training their dogs rather than using their hands to use um, to incorporate unique hand gestures for their requests. Um, and it can be very confusing when you're just standing there saying, sit, sit, stay, sit, sit, sit to your dog. So using your hand signals and your hand gestures is going to be very, very useful and valuable in helping to set your dog up for success. So that's what I mean um, as a concept of setting your dog up for success in that type of um, environment, considering the way that dogs see things. And once again, the binocular vision of dogs um, isn't as... Uh, uh, isn't as well developed as ours because when we consider the position of our eyes and of course they're facing uh, directly ahead uh, we have overlapping visual fields with respect to our binocular vision but if you consider dogs the position of dogs eyes sometimes they're more laterally positioned and the, the effect of this is that they have a reduced ability to um, perceive depth as well as see things in a three-dimensional way. So this is also very useful to know when we're um, looking at training with our dogs because if we're holding our food lure too close or too too close to them um, and also the length of their nose can also um, impede their vision as well um, if an object or like a food lure, is, food lure is too close to their nose and then that can mean that they're going to be having difficulty in seeing that that food lure when we're training with them. So that's another interesting way of how taking into account the way dogs see compared to us um, and then using that information to help set them up for success by adjusting the way we train with them. So we're communicating clearly in a way that they can clearly understand and see. Now, the other thing about dogs' perception of um, colours with their vision is that they do see in colour, but they do have a limited ability to distinguish colours. And red and green, for example, can be quite confusing. So once again, let's think about how we can set our dogs up for success by looking at the environment. Um, once again, um, what we're wearing, if we're wearing nice contrasting colours that they can readily see, if we're training in a public place or even if we've taken our dog to an off-leash park um, and that's another subject another topic that I'm going to do another podcast on because there's a lot of things you you, you should know as dog owners before you decide to um, go off to the off-leash park with your dog but um, if your dog can see you readily um, because you're identifying yourself with with contrasting colors 
with your clothes, that's going to be much easier for you to also get your dog's attention. And when you're using your combination of hand gestures um, for your recalls, you're also making it easier for your dog to understand what you'd like them to do. And it's especially useful in puppy classes when we're getting um, puppies used to different things. So for example, sometimes we might incorporate a little agility tunnel or some other um, things for them to interact with, but keeping them in, um, in contrasting colours enables them to see them properly and also navigate them safely. And that reduces them being startled and it also increases the um, likelihood of them having a pleasant uh, association when we're using positive reinforcement in that sort of environment. And once again, things like um, agility training, if you're wanting to do agility with your dog, think about, just be a little bit, bit thoughtful about the colour of the equipment and like the hurdles, the jumps or weave poles and think about colours that make it easy for your dog to see. And once again, you're setting your dog up for success. Um, and especially when you're working on doing your recall or you might be doing long leash work, make sure that you've got a nice open area with plenty of room and a good view because then you can actually see people uh, and other dogs if they're approaching you from, uh, from a distance on the horizon, particularly if your dog has very good peripheral vision when we were talking about um, the, uh, w whether they have a visual streak or they're likely to have a central area of concentrated um, vis vision cells in their retina depending on their nose length and then again related back to their breed. The other thing I wanted to talk about was how um, our dogs hear. Now because they hear much higher frequencies uh, than us and they also hear things at a greater distance, just have a think about a potentially noisy training environment. Is your dog going to be able to distinguish your voice? Um, but that's that's Again, a situation where your hand gestures coupled with your verbal cues are going to help your dog to see you um, and not just hear you. And then you're going to communicate much more clearly. And once again, um, we're talking about you know a public sort of environment like a park or other place where you might be wanting to train. Um, now, the flip side of this is that if you're in a quiet environment, then you know use a quiet voice because, again, our dogs can hear... Um, very acutely so using a nice quiet voice is always a nice way to train with your dog and you're setting them up for success because you're taking into account how they hear things and you're adjusting your training voice accordingly. Now there's a little video uh, a few video clips that I wanted to share with you that's that I'm hoping is going to help you um, identify how you can um, critically evaluate you, the way you're training with your dog and pick up things that you might be doing that could be confusing or exaggerating something that might be hindering your dog in a training session. So the first clip, I'll set that up. The first clip is, um, I started Marco on a training session, but he was quite, I was using high value treats. So these are ones that he hadn't had for a while and they're really tasty and really smelly, really nice and aromatic. And of course he likes doing training sessions, but the thing that was um, that was um, coming through was that because of these two things, and I think he was also probably a little bit hungry, it might have been a little bit of time between breakfast and morning tea. So the combination of all of that meant that he was taking the treats very excitedly and this can actually um, hinder the training session because Marco might be focused more on the treats rather than learning and because that's going to make him even more excited. So let's just have a look at the video clip. This is video clip number one. All right. So we'll just look at look at this through once first. Okay, and I just want you to focus on how Marco's taking the treat. So look, he leapt forward there, he was very excited. And he did drop the treat because um, he was quite excited. So he didn't take it as smoothly as I hoped. Trying again, yes, look, he's really, really excited to take those treats so um, I'm just trying to um, bridge and reward him to give him a few treats in a shorter period of time but let him know he's doing a nice behavior just being focused on me and once again so he's taking it not very smoothly and he's very excited so he almost dropped it there and once again he's very excited so from that clip we can see that the combination of Marco being excited and possibly a little bit hungry before that training session and then his natural excitement to want to train, those that combination was just 
hindering his learning there. And so that's my responsibility to try to um, adjust for that and try to think of ways that I can actually set him up for success. So ways that I thought I could set him up for success w- would be to basically give him a finish cue and just sort of leave the training session for a few minutes, give him a little snack, um, which might fill him up a little bit more, or just maybe go for a walk and let him have a sniff or give him some other structured activity just to keep him nice and happy and reduce and release some of that excitement um, and get him back into the mindset of learning. And just to realise that in that case, the food was actually overexciting him. So that was an interesting little clip. Um, Now the second clip, now I'll set this one up here. So basically because of the the outcome in the first clip, I was starting to think to myself, okay, what I need to do is um, I need to make sure that I'm trying to deliver the treat as smoothly as possible to Marco because he was just sort of, you know, leaping forward a little bit there. And that's not the sort of, um, that's not, you know, how I don't want him to be that excited or, uh, you, know, you know, be ex- that excited in a training session because it's going to detract from his learning, as I mentioned before. But the thing that I thought I needed to focus on was to be proactive in just in adjusting my hand technique and you can see that the, in this clip here it's pretty clear now we'll just have a look through um, there will be some blue circles that are going to outline things to pay attention to so we might run this little video a couple of times but let's just have a look and I want you to pay attention to the distance that my arm is being reached out towards Marco Right, so there's that blue circle there, just sort of identifying where my hand is meeting to Marco to give him that treat smoothly. He's moving forward again. I should have leaned forward there just to make sure that he wasn't having to move forward. That was a better delivery. You can see that he was m- remaining in the sit there. Let's look at it from another angle. You can see that he had to move forward because I wasn't leaning, uh, reaching my arm out uh, enough for him. That was a bit better. Okay, that was a little bit better. I'm just going to run that again. Let's just have one more look at that. Okay, once again. Now, see, I should have moved forward. I did step out on my right foot, but I should have extended my arm a little bit more. Marco still had to lean forward there, so I needed to reach out even though I stepped my my foot forward. I'm just alternating, alternating the stand there to get him to move out of the sit position again. And that was a bit better, but I still could have uh, leaned out a little bit further. And once again, from this angle, I need to lean forward. So you can see that Marco's moving forward and I wanted him to stay in the sit. So I needed to adjust the reach of my hand there. Okay. All right. So that's a really, really nice little example of how you can hinder the training session and actually, um, you can actually start seeing Um, behaviours that you really don't want to see and and one behaviour was Marco was breaking from the sit and that was simply because I wasn't leaning forward enough so that's a really nice little example um, and a nice little lesson to take away from that one. Now the third clip um, right now we'll just run this through Um, okay now you will see a blue circle that's just to get you to focus on my right knee and my right foot Okay, so we'll run through this video once. This is clip three. Okay. Now Marco's coming back, yes, and we're giving him a start cue. Now watch my knee. I didn't step out there with my right foot. And again, I'm leaning over and Marco's having to, you know, raise his bottom up off the ground there. Once again, he's breaking from the sit because you can see I'm not leaning far enough forward. And again, now watch this long blue arrow that's going to be focusing on my right foot. And here it is. Now I haven't stepped out at all and I've just popped onto my knees there. So that's a really interesting little example. We'll just might just run through that again, just so you you, um, can see that again a little bit better. So, um, but just before we do that, just want to reiterate with a blue circle, just focus on my right knee and my right foot. You see I'm leaning forward, but I haven't stepped that right foot out again. 
my arm needs to reach out further towards Marco in order to deliver, to deliver that treat smoothly to him. And once again, you see the blue arrow highlighting that that right foot still needs to step out because then it's going to bridge that distance and get me to reach my hand closer to Marco's mouth to deliver that treat a lot smoothly to him and keep him in the sit position, which is what the goal of the training session is to be. Okay, so we'll just run through that one more time. Here we go. Marco's coming back. Hello, Marco. All right, and again, we've got our start cue here. Watch my leg. Okay, and yes, I'm leaning over. Now, because Marco is a little dog, you don't want to lean over too much. So, um, but once again, stepping out with my right foot would have, sol would have solved that issue as well. And once again, leaning over too far without stepping that right foot out. And the blue arrow, I should have stepped that right foot out. That would have allowed me to bridge that gap. So from those brief video clips, I just hope, I was just, what I'm hoping is that you can get an idea of what setting your dog up for success, for success means. Um, so being proactive, always thinking about how we're approaching our technique and making those slight changes as they're needed, which is always going to be based on how our dog responds. And as you can see, we had the combination of Marco being a little bit hungry, having lovely, tasty, smelly treats, and that getting his excitement levels up in combination with his readiness to, readiness to train was just increasing his excitement levels a little bit too much. So, um, so I needed to step out and close the distance so he wasn't actually having to move forward for the treat because I'd like him to remain in the sit position. So I need to troubleshoot that and make sure that I'm making the adjustments. So Marco's, um, Marco is actually being communicated to clearly and that means that I need to extend my arm out a little bit further. Now, um, just, to, just to mention, I did decide to give Marco a finish cue and just stop the training session for a little bit and I gave him a food puzzle toy, as I mentioned before, just to help him release some mental energy as well as give him um, a little bit of food. Um, and we tried the training session a little bit later on with some treats that were a little bit more boring from his point of view. And once again, um, if we think about how our dog's sense of smell is so acute and so amazing, um, we can then adjust our training um, to, by taking that information into account as well. So just overall taking the approach in that way to our training helps us also just to build on the information we've learned in our previous training sessions and then we can find out what's not working and how to improve it for the next one. And the best way to do this is to just simply video record your training sessions and look from just from the feedback that um, you know I was uh, talking to you about from, from those little clips, it's a really great way to evaluate your technique but most importantly look at your dog's response. And that's going to tell you all the information that you need. Because if your dog is re responding in the way that you're hoping, then you know that your technique is working. But if not, then you have to take a step back and say, okay, was I leaning over too much? Was I not reaching out? Was I not timing my bridge? Lots of different situations. But I've just given you those little um, pieces of information and feedback that I gleaned from those clips, just watching those back, that I thought were relevant to those clips and would be helpful. Um, and just remembering also that the training sessions are really good, um, they're invaluable, but also your real world opportunities where you're rewarding your dog just for offering you those lovely behaviours that you're looking for, just offering a sit um, or just, you know, focusing on you nice and quietly or even just, um, you know, sitting there on their mat, um, amusing themselves with a chew toy or a food puzzle toy. Um, you know, to keep them quietly occupied. Um, so, so that's really nice because incorporating those things, it really adds to the journey of training with your dog. Um, and it also gets you so much better at observing your dog in everyday situations. And then that helps you to be more consistent and provide routine and predictability. And I've mentioned these sort of things, you know, that's, it's, it's a theme that's interwoven through all of the episodes so far. So um, just to, to summarise the, 
the podcast, thinking about how our dog senses differ from ours and how we can understand that and then build our training sessions around that using hand gestures, taking into account the environment, the distractions, how our dog is likely to be distracted in those environments based on their senses um, and also making sure that um, we manage the situations with common sense um, and it just give you finish cue and you know change the situation and reward them with a structured activity or go for a short walk to have a sniff, expend some mental energy or you know like I did um, in that example just try some treats that were you know a little bit more boring in that case to bring the excitement levels down but not so boring that your dog's not going to want to interact with you in a training environment. So um, that's a really good place to end the podcast for today. Now, if you'd like to um, see more of the True, Heart Tra True Hearted Trainer podcast, um, there's an, I, an, an information icon just in the upper right screen. Just click on that and you can access the other videos, the other podcast episodes there. So I hope you enjoy this podcast. Um, thanks very much for joining me for episode five of the True Hearted Trainer podcast. How do we set our dogs up for success in training and what does this mean? I'm Dr. Lisa, I'm your host, and uh, please feel free to like this video and share this video. And if you're new to the channel, please subscribe and hit the notifications bell because you'll get updated as each episode is released. And once again, you can follow me on Instagram at The True Hearted Trainer. I'm on Twitter and Facebook. And if you'd like a free copy of my ebook, Five Essential Concepts of Dog Training, email me at info at vcabs.com.au. All right, we'll finish there. I'm Dr. Lisa once again. Thanks very much for joining me. Stay positive.